more than this computer. Ah. So, Raphael, uh, hello, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to Binawagan ni Jane ang Police on Anti-Carceral Feminism, Confronting Domestic Violence Without the Police and the Need to Abolish the Rescue Industry. Uh, in many situations, women are typically treated as victims, devoid of power and free will, rather than as survivors who exercise their agency within the limits of their context spaces. Enter the police and rescue-oriented organizations and institutions who's posturing as strong and trustworthy actors who not only want to not only not only want to help belize their machismo, saver complex, and even actual role and participation in reproducing systems and structures that systematically oppress non-men and other marginalized sectors. Today we'll be listening to uh, Victoria Law, who Victoria Law is a freelance journalist who whose work focuses on the intersection of incarceration, gender, and resistance. She is the author of Resistance Behind Bars, The Struggles of Incarcerated Women. Uh, she's the co-author of Prison by Any Other Name, The Harmful Consequences of Popular Reforms, and the forthcoming Prisons Make Us Safer and 20 Other Myths About Mass Incarceration, published by Be uh, to be published by Beacon Press. She is the co-editor of Don't Leave Your Friends Behind, Concrete Ways to Support Families and Social Justice Movements Communities. Her writings about incarceration have appeared online and in print in outlets including the New York Times, The Nation, Wired, Miss Magazine, and Truth Health. She is a co-founder of Books to Lars and Moisey, an all-volunteer program that sends free books to people in prison across the country, and was the longtime editor of Design Tunisia's Art and Writings for Women in Prison. She lives in New York City with her daughter. So welcome, Victoria Law. Uh, would you like to take over? <laughs> sure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for getting up fairly early and spending part of your Saturday morning with me. I understand that it is a uh, time difference between New York, where I am, and the Philippines makes this not necessarily the easiest uh, time fit. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Um, if there is anything that you are unclear about, or if I am speaking too fast, or if you just can't hear me very well, please let me know. Um, my eyes are not great on Zoom, so if you raise your hands and I don't notice, just feel free to unmute yourself and just say, hey, we can't hear you, or slow down, or can you please explain what that term is? Because I'm not always super savvy about being able to see everybody else's uh, screens. So thank you again for coming out. Um, I'm going to be talking about the intersections of gender violence and prison abolition here in the United States. I will give the, a trigger warning because I will be talking about domestic and family violence. I won't talk about them explicitly, but I will be talking about their existence and giving some examples of how the uh, of how policing and imprisonment has failed to keep women and children safe, similar to what we had been talking about earlier uh, in, you know, in the discussion that happens before. Um, so to give a little bit of context, the United States has 5% of the world's total population and 25% of uh, the world's prison population. So the United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world. Um, it has, I think it has the highest women's incarceration rate in the world as well. Um, in the past 30 to 40 years, there have been a series of laws that have been passed supposedly to protect women and children from gender-based violence, including family violence, domestic violence, and sexual violence. And it has not done very much to keep many women and children safe because what it does is it puts a policing and prison solution to everything that happens rather than addressing root causes as to why women and children most often bear the brunt of violence. So I'm going to start with a story again 
I'll give a trigger warning um, because I will be talking about family violence um, of a case that happened here in the United States. Uh, let's see if, oh, okay. Um, so in July of 2016 in Ohio, which is the Midwest, there was a 14 year old girl named Brisha Meadows. She was a young black girl um, who was arrested for shooting and killing her father. Her father, Jonathan, had terrorized her and her family for her entire life. Throughout her childhood, Brisha had grown up watching as her father abused her mother, punching her, kicking her, stomping her. And he threatened to kill his wife and their three children if they, she ever tried to leave. Brisha's mother's name is Brandy, by the way. Uh, her father, Jonathan, had put Brandy in the hospital over 15 times. In 2011, when Brisha was nine years old, Brandy did attempt to leave. She moved out of the house with her children and filed for an order of protection after her husband had broken her ribs, her fingers, and the blood vessels in her hands. She had moved out, she started to move on with her life, and he did what many abusive people do, which is he apologized and he promised to change. He promised it would never happen again, and she returned. Now, keep in mind, this is not unusual. I'm assuming that the statistics might be similar in the Philippines and other places, but in the US, it takes between seven to 10 times for a person to leave an abusive relationship. So remember that domestic violence and family violence is not just all harm and violence, but it's also a tangled ball of love and care and then harm, you know, so you mix those all up together. But when Brandy came back, the abuse didn't stop. And instead her husband subjected her to even tighter controls, including telling her that she had to wake him up at night before leaving the bed to use the bathroom. Around that time, he also began sexually abusing Brisha. Fast forward to four years later, Brisha is 13 years old and she's had enough and she runs away to her aunt's house. Her father calls the police and accuses his sister-in-law of kidnapping. The police call the sister-in-law and tell her that she must return Brisha to her father's house or else they will arrest her. So Brisha was returned home. Her aunt, by the way, is a police officer in Cleveland's domestic violence unit. So Brisha was in Warren, which was a small town or a suburb outside of Cleveland and her aunt was a police officer in the Cleveland Police uh, Department, so in the larger city. And she was specifically in the domestic violence unit and she was responsible for domestic violence cases in the city of Cleveland and for training police in domestic violence and how to respond to domestic violence calls. So her aunt, thinking that she is a police officer, went to the local precinct in Warren and asked the police to perform what's known as wellness checks in the US in which police come by just to make sure everything is okay. They're supposed to do this if they get a call for somebody in a mental health crisis, if there's um, other issues. And they're not, they're not supposed to be, we're here because we think you're doing something wrong. It's more like supposed to be, are you okay? Um, and there's, we can have a whole other conversation about how these are not actually wellness checks, but on paper and in theory and among police, that's what they're supposed to do. And instead of just stopping by the Meadows house the following day or the week after to say, hey, we just wanted to make sure everything is okay with your family. Um, they stopped by the house and they told Jonathan that his sister-in-law had asked them to check on him. And as you can imagine, that did not go over very well. And I want to point out that this is very similar to um, what we had talked about earlier about police not taking family violence and domestic violence seriously. Um, so the abuse not only continued, but because Brisha had run away, it got even worse. Around the same time, Brisha's grades began to fall. She'd been a straight A student and suddenly her grades were tanking. But nobody in the school system took enough notice to find out what was going on at home. The following year, Brisha ran away again. And this time, her aunt, the police officer, 
called uh, what we call in the United States, the Department of Family Services, which is supposed to specifically deal with allegations of child abuse. Um, in the United States, if people call the Department of Child Family Services and report child abuse, social workers are supposed to come to the house and find out if there is abuse happening, and if so, remove the child from the house temporarily until they can figure out what's going on or make a decision that this child should is not safe in their family's house. What ended up happening is that social workers came and they interviewed both of Brisha's parents together. And Brisha's mother later said, what can I say to this lady when Jonathan is sitting right next to me? So nothing came out of that complaint except for another escalation of Jonathan's violence. Finally, in July, Brisha shot and killed her father with the gun that he had been using to terrorize his family. She was arrested. Prosecutors deliberated charging her as an adult, which meant that if she were convicted or found guilty in court of first degree murder, she would have served life in prison. Now remember, Brisha was 14 years old. And her story might have had a very unhappy ending if her case had not caught the attention of organizers and she received an outpouring of support, including media attention and a flurry of letters and phone calls to the prosecutor. So first, the prosecutors decided after all of this media attention and public pressure that they were going to charge her as a child. So in the United States, we have juvenile courts. So somebody uh, Brisha's age at the time, 14 years old, could be tried as a child, meaning that if she was convicted, she would only be incarcerated until she was 21 years old and she would serve that time in a juvenile facility or in many states, prosecutors can, char can choose to charge a child that young as an adult in which they go to adult court. And they are, um, and if they are convicted, they are sentenced to an adult prison, and they can be sentenced um, to sentences as long as life in prison or life without parole, even though they are children. So first, the prosecutors decided to charge her as a child, meaning that even if she lost her battle in court, she would be incarcerated until age 21 not for the rest of her life. And there was more organizing, there was more support, there were rallies, uh, there were demonstrations, there was more media attention being paid to this case. And finally, buckling under this pressure, the prosecutors agreed to allow her to plea bargain in which she pled true, which is the juvenile equivalent of guilty. And she was sentenced to a year and a day in the juvenile jail, which includes the nine months she had served already torn away from her family and stuck behind bars. Plus she had to spend six months <clears throat> in a mental health treatment center and another two years of probation. Still, this was not life in prison. This was not even the next seven years of her life in a children's prison. Um, Brisha spent her 15th and 16th birthdays, plus all of the Christmases and other holidays behind bars away from her family and was released from the treatment center in February of 2018. Let's for fast forward to today. Um, she is currently a college student. She is an organizer. She is doing work around prison rights and uh, domestic violence because these are things that she herself has experienced. And I say, and she's able to do this in spite of the policing and prison system, not because police and prison protected her. And I start with that story so that we can see how relying on policing, prosecution and imprisonment doesn't necessarily stop violence and at times can worsen an abusive or violent situation. And then we can also look at all of the different systems that failed Brisha and her family throughout the years. So in the United States, we don't know the number of abuse survivors of any gender or any age group who are currently incarcerated for similar acts of self-defense. There are no national statistics about this, so we actually don't know 
how many other Brescia Meadows there have been or there are in the system. So um, this talk is called Anti-Carceral Feminism. And hmm, I don't know how to do this on Zoom. Uh, if there's a way to do a quick show of hands as how many of you have heard the term carceral feminism before today? Uh, well, we can probably use the raise hand function to give a raise okay. hands. Or, or there's right. a poll function. Wait, actually, let's try the poll. I haven't tried that yet. Uh, ask the question, how many? Oh, I've never used this before. Maybe let's just use a raise hand. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sure. Okay, so just by a show of hands, how many of you have heard the term carceral feminism before today? Uh, to do hands, you go to the bottom of the screen, there should be something called reaction. And when you click, click reactions, there's like uh, some emojis. And then at the bottom, it says raise hand. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Okay. So carceral, the term carceral feminism has not uh, gone over to, to the Philippines yet. So um, carceral feminism is the term that is often, at least in the United States, used to describe a reliance on increased policing and prosecution and imprisonment as the primary solution to gender-based violence, whether that violence is sexual assault, sexual abuse, or domestic violence. Uh, carceral feminism is a term used to describe this reliance. It is very rarely used, if ever, by people who rely on them. So when you have people who say that they are feminists and want more policing or more prisons or more prosecution to end domestic violence or to end sexual assault or to end sexual abuse, they don't go around calling themselves carceral feminists. Um, it is a term that is used to designate this reliance and this mindset, but it is not one that is actually embraced by the people who uh, want more policing and more prisons. So this reliance on policing and imprisonment ignores the many ways in which intersecting identities in the US, this includes race and class and gender identity and sexuality and immigration status, leave certain women more vulnerable to violence, including opening the door for state violence to happen. Relying on policing and prisons also ignores the ways the state and its systems continually fail to protect marginalized people, including women of color, trans and gender non-conforming people, queer people, poor people, and immigrants. We see this in the case of Brisha Meadows and her family. Brisha was a little black girl. Um, she literally was little. Her head did not come up to the judge's bench when she, uh, when she was sentenced uh, at the time. So we see this in the case of a 14 year old being threatened with life in prison. Now ask yourselves, what were the ways in which state systems could have intervened but did not? Starting from when her mother Brandy moved out, uh, starting from when her grades began to fall in school or Brisha started running away. Like where were all the points in which that story could have become different? if one of these systems in place that's supposed to help children could have intervened, but again, at that time did not. So carceral feminism also ignores the ways in which we see the state coming down hard on marginalized women. And in the United States, at the same time as carceral feminists were calling for more policing and more prisons, we saw a massive increase in women's incarceration. So in the United States, in 1970, there were 5,600 women in jails and prisons across the nation. And I apologize, I should have looked this up before. I do not know how many women are in jails and prisons in the Philippines to give you a comparison. I deeply apologize uh, when we open up to q and I'll do a quick search. Um, but by 1980, 10 years later, that number had uh, risen nearly five times to 25,450 women. By 1990, that number had tripled to nearly 78,000. In 2000, that number had doubled again 
to 156,000. So think of this, every 10 years, this number just up and up and up. And as of 2019, there are approximately 225,000 women in jails and prisons across the United States. Uh, keep in mind that these 225,000 women does not include the women who are in immigrant detention centers in the United States. Immigrant detention is considered a civil commitment, meaning that you are there because you are in violation of a rule, but not because you broke the law. Um, it does not include girls who are in youth jails or trans women who are in men's jails or men's prisons. So the number of uh, women behind bars is much higher than this 225,000 number, but it is still very, very high. At least half of women in prisons and jails reported surviving violence, sexual violence, and or domestic violence, even before their arrest. And keep in mind that when you are in a jail or prison, oftentimes you are not very willing to disclose intimate details of your life to people who have locked you up or people who are there with a clipboard. Um, in the juvenile jail system, 84% of girls reported experiencing past abuse. And we can think that this is probably a much higher rate. Um, now I want to introduce another term that I, I don't know if this is very um, common or familiar or frequently used in the Philippines. But again, if people uh, want to do a quick show of hands through the reactions. If you go down to the lower screen, you go to reactions, you can raise your hand or you know make some sort of emoji. How many of you have heard the term restorative justice? Okay. So that seems to be people, uh, more people have heard restorative justice than uh, carceral feminism. Okay, so to get everybody on the same page, uh, restorative justice is seen as an alternative to incarceration a lot of times. It's a process that involves, to the extent that's possible, people who have uh, a stake in something that happened, in harm that has happened. And the goal is to collectively identify and to redress the harm the needs and the obligations of both the survivor and the person or persons causing the harm in order to heal and to put things as right as possible. So often this means that victims come together with the people who have caused harm along with others who are in the community who may have been affected. So instead of it being, uh, if I punch somebody else, me and this other person just sit down and like yell at each other, it's a, you know, usually a circle of people where it's like, I punch somebody else and we sit in a circle with uh, trained facilitators as well as people who have also been affected by this harm. So if I punch, I don't know, my neighbor who has two kids an aging mother and a, uh, you know, life partner and maybe all of that family shows up to say, how did this affect them as well? You know, maybe the person that I punched now has a fear of going out at a certain time or has a fear of walking past my door. How does this affect their ability to parent or to caregive for their aging parent or their ability to go out and buy groceries if they are afraid of being assaulted again? What are the ripple effects of what I did on this person? Not just, I'm sorry, I punched you in the nose and that's it. Um, that is the idea behind it. And at the same time, I would have people there that say, Hey, Vicky, you, you know, we've noticed you've become more aggressive and angry lately. Um, and we want to hold you accountable for this. And what can you do to make sure this doesn't happen again? Um, and instead of punishment being doled out from a judge or an authority figure on high, or even from the facilitator, the participants try to move towards an agreement on how to address the situation, including how the victim will be supported in their healing so that they can move beyond being a victim towards being a survivor and how the person who did the harm will be held accountable. So not just, I'm sorry, but it's like, how am I going to be held accountable and how do we make sure that this doesn't happen again? Maybe it's, I need to go to anger management classes. Maybe it's, I need to do, you know, X, Y, or Z to make sure that, you know, I don't get angry and aggressive 
at people, maybe to make sure that maybe I need to pay for this person's counseling or therapy so that they can uh, process what happened to them and not let it control their lives. There's all sorts of things that can happen um, in this as people start to flesh this out. And I'm going to give an example um, of what restorative justice looks like on a community level. And for that, I'm going to go to Canada to Hollow Water, an Ojibwe reserve that's uh, just north of Winnipeg, Canada. Um, again, I will be talking not explicitly about sexual and family violence, but this is the restorative justice program that they put together to address sexual and family violence. So um, I'm going to give you a trigger warning if you need to like mute me for a bit, duck out of the discussion. Um, I do believe that there are a couple of people uh, on this Zoom call who can, you know, be, uh, who are there to support folks who are feeling triggered or might need to process. Um, so Hollow Water is an Ojibwe reserve north of Winnipeg. Uh, the Ojibwe are one of the First Nations or uh, people in Canada uh, who have been decimated by colonialism uh, throughout the centuries. In Hollow Water, two thirds of Hollow Water's 450 residents have experienced sexual abuse at the hands of family members. So it is not a big community, but there has been a lot of sexual abuse by family members. And as we now know, sexual abuse and sexual violence and trauma are often handed down generationally. Um, and that's what the people of Hollow Residence also understood. They understood that relying on the traditional criminal legal system in which there were polices and police and prosecutors and judges and courts require children to testify against their abusive loved ones. So they had to relive that trauma and they had to take a stand and they had to say to their beloved father or mother or grandfather or auntie or uncle, you know, you did this to me, you know, and again, when we think about family violence, it's often a tangle of love and harm and care and wanting to be loved and wanting violence to stop, but not wanting that person to be torn away from your life. And they had, the children would have to testify in a way that convinced others that they were telling the truth. It was an approach that fragmented a community that had already been torn apart by decades of residential schools um, in Canada and the US and other places where uh, white colonial settlers went uh, and uh, decimated the populations that were already there. Part of the decimation was uh, pulling children away from their families and forcibly placing them in what they called residential schools in which they were forced to assimilate and unlearn uh, their Native American or First Nation ways. Um, and it tore families apart, it tore communities apart, it wiped out entire cultures. Um, and so on the backs of this, you have hollow water in the 20th, 21st century. Um, so this community had already been torn apart by residential schools, forced displacement, systemic poverty and racism. And now you also have endemic child sexual abuse and trying to address this. Um, the hollow water residents revived the healing circle, which is a traditional form of addressing harm and violence. And this community holistic healing circle was a lengthy process. So it wasn't a one day or two day process. It wasn't even a four or five day process or a two week process like going to court, like a court trial would be. It was a years long process. For instance, for one couple who had sexually abused two of their five children, the process took several years. All of their children had been removed to foster care outside the community. So basically uh, child services removed their children to homes that were outside of Hollow Water altogether. And only after the couple had participated in both the healing circle and individual counseling for two years were the children moved to foster care homes within the community. So they were allowed to stay in the community with other families um, who had been uh, screened and trained to, to uh, house and live with and raise children who had been abused but were not their parents. Um, the children began participating in family counseling sessions with their parents. And after a while, relationships began to mend and they started building trust again. One of the daughters said during a family counseling session, 
I could trust my dad being alone with him. I couldn't trust him before. We sit down and talk about what he done. He's telling us over and over how sorry he is. He is. I've come a long way. Now I want you to think about what might have happened had Risha's family been able to access a program like this during her childhood. If instead of saying, you know, like, uh, I'm leaving or I'm calling the police or I'm going to get you locked up, if Risha's family had been able to say, we love this father or husband, but we want him to stop being violent. Think about what might happen where you live if families had access to programs that understood that family violence happens in a context in which people uh, care for each other and don't necessarily want to just separate and leave and banish each other from their lives, but want the harm and the violence to stop and want to get to that root cause and be able to say, I feel safe around you. I don't have to walk on eggshells anymore. I don't have to worry that you are going to harm me. And for the other person, the person who's doing the harm to say, I now understand you know, what my harm is doing to you, but I also now have tools to make sure that I do not keep causing this harm. In the United States, there are no programs um, in that same scope. In Vermont, um, which is a small uh, state in the Northeast, uh, made most famous perhaps by Bernie Sanders being the senator there, there is a program called Stop It Now, um, which provided support for people who had committed child sexual abuse for four years. And instead of just saying, call the police, it utilized a public health approach similar to campaigns against drunk driving that were happening in the United States. So through both media and public outreach, it provided information on how to recognize and address child sexual abuse. So in the United States, as in many places, I'm sure, when child sexual abuse happens, it's often it's not the stranger that jumps out of you at the bushes or is in the white sand, but it's often at the hands of somebody that a child knows and trusts um, and does not necessarily want to get in trouble, like a beloved family member or a neighbor or somebody you know in their church or their community. Uh, so it taught people how to recognize and address child sexual abuse. Um, first of all. And then it also provided resources and encouragement to those who are abusing a child to seek help in stopping the abuse. And at the same time, the state sponsored a pre-sentence alternative program for adolescents and children who had perpetrated sexually abusive acts. So that meant that instead of looking at going to jail when uh, they had sexually abused somebody else, uh, adolescents and children were able to participate in a program to stop sexually abusive behaviors and acts. And between 1995 and 1999, over 100 people, nearly all of them were adolescents or children, voluntarily came forward to seek help so that they would not continue to engage in sexual abuse. So that is one example of a program that instead of saying, we're going to call the police and we're going to lock you up and that is it, says, how do we get to the root of this problem? So that that way you don't continue to perpetuate this type of harm. Okay, I feel like I have been talking a lot. Um, are there any questions or comments? And I apologize, I have not been looking at the chat while I was that, talking. That's okay, um, I can uh, read some of the things in the chat. Mm -hmm. OEXA says, um, the concept of transformative justice is relatively new and they just learned it from the past educational discussion. Uh, let's see. Um, Tintadong says in Peter Gadelu's book, Anarchy Works, there's a section where they talk about imposed laws not being flexible enough to cater both the victim and the attacker's needs. Yeah, there was abolitionist stuff there. Uh, Gary mm -hmm. Musna says police is the most a uh, bullshit profession primarily for crea created to protect the property of the ruling class so they can have monopoly of violence. In the Philippines, the police can't do basic psychosocial interventions and the worst, they're the ones committing sexual abuses. Yeah. Yeah, aren't they? <laughs> I'm also victim of police violence, so... Same. I think that's, <laughs> yeah, that's the same for the U.S., especially for sex workers. 
Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, perhaps you have something to say about that, honey? If you want to share? Oh, no, I'm just commenting that in the US as well, mm -hmm. um, like what happened in the Philippines, I know that everyone is familiar with the case or if everyone is familiar with the case of the child who was who was in a party, who was um, held because of curfew, and then who was raped by the police as well. And then when he went to the police to report about it, um, she was killed after reporting it. Um, so it's basically the same thing that is happening in the US as well for sex workers, especially black and brown, women sex workers, immigrant sex workers, um, because of the criminalization of sex work, um, you know, um, sex workers cannot report abuses by their clients or, you know, um, police themselves ab abuse them because, you know, um, sex work is criminalized. So you cannot report it. Um, you will be, you yourself, if you're gonna report it, you will be charged you will be incarcerated as well. Mm -hmm. um, Oyansa asks if, uh, honey, were you talking about Fabel Pineda? Yes, yes, that Super. one. Indeed. Uh, the topic of... <laughs> yes. Um, since uh, we've been entered uh, the next section, I'll open up uh, the... Presentation again, share screen. Um, let's go to the next section on question and answer. Uh, so far, the highest voted question is, what do is uh, what did the hosts think of the mainstream feminist response to, gen to the death of Jennifer Lodi and the release of her killer uh, due to be being to junk the visiting forces agreement uh, in uh, in a uh, carcel feminist response instead of decriminalizing sex work. For Victoria, uh, the context is that Jennifer Laude was a um, trans woman uh, mm -hmm. who went on a one night stand with a US soldier here on a visiting forces agreement. And then that US soldier murdered her violently in the bathroom, uh, murdered her violently, mm -hmm. very gruesome murder. Um, he was given special treatment during the trial, even though he was unrepentant, uh, refused to use her pronouns, for example. Um, and then uh, to the point being where she, uh, his special treatment led to the point of him having a, uh, an entire incarceration facility set up just for him uh, only because he was a US military serviceman. And in the past year, he was uh, pardoned by the president. Um, and it's un unknown why he was pardoned. Uh, so there's some speculation that, uh, he, that the president was possibly paid off, but there's no proof of that matter. So, um, so uh, what's one the question? question? Was, he pardoned, was he pardoned by the Filipino president or the US president? Yes, he was pardoned by the Filipino US president. president. Okay. Right. And he, okay. he was, and then he was allowed to return to the United States without any fanfare. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. the question is, what, uh, what do you think of the mainstream feminist response to Jennifer Laude's death? Because there was a lot of uh, carceral feminist uh, logic regarding, um, regarding, regarding uh, the the murderer. Mm -hmm. So, perhaps. What, could, what do you think about it through an anti-carceral lens? Um, because after all, the victim, see, Jen Jennifer Laude was murdered. <laughs> yes. I mean, what we can say, first of all, is that we can see this tragic outcome and then the travesty of the, you know, what happened afterwards in terms of the legal system illustrates that policing and prisons are not designed to keep women safe. And they're definitely not designed to keep marginalized women safe, such as trans women, because the threat of policing and imprisonment, and imprisonment in the Philippines did not stop this man from, from, uh, from killing her. So right there, there is a failure. And we see this again and again and again in that 
the threat of policing and prisons does not stop gender-based violence. And then what happened in the aftermath of her tragic death was a call for these same systems that did not deter this man from exercising his power over a woman who was trans, who was a woman who was uh, Filipina, to, uh, you know, was then basically, you know, given a punishment that was seen as light, but did not actually address any of the root causes. Um, then he received a pardon because this is just what people in power get is better treatment. And the idea that more prisons and more policing would somehow deter any other transphobic, racist person from assaulting any other trans woman of color, whether it be in the Philippines, in the United States, in any other country in the world is just ridiculous because it did not stop this man. I mean, I'm assuming the Philippines has laws about murdering people in which you are not allowed to do that. In the US, there are certainly laws about murdering people and technically you are not allowed to do that. But people who are in positions of power know that they can get away with harming people who are in positions of black power. Um, and we, this has been ingrained in people from the very beginning. So in the United States, um, there have been numerous uh, documentaries and news segments and everything else about the police killings of black people, including black children. And every black family who has black children has to give a talk to their children about what to do when they are stopped by the police. You know, make sure you appear non-threatening, make sure this, make sure that, because they don't want their children to be killed. Uh, white families do not have to have this conversation because there is an understanding that that whiteness will allow them to pass through unharmed. There are occasions when this does not happen and when white people are also harmed or killed by the police, but there is not this systemic underlying understanding that it is not safe, um, that these systems are not safe. These officers who represent these systems are not working for you and they do not have your best interest at heart. So I think that having you know, a carceral feminist response, which is we need more police, we need more prisons and we need that man to serve more prison time um, is going to get to the root of the problem means that basically it's kind of like um, in the US there's a saying, you've closed the barn door after the horse has left. It's kind of like that, like somebody came and stole your horse or your horse has run away. And then you're like, oh, I guess I should close this door. So imprisoning him for a longer period of time will not bring this woman back. It will not change his behavior. Um, and it will not make any person who is transphobic or you know hates women or you know has murderous intentions think twice about it. I mean, I see that there are 31 people now on this Zoom call and I'm not gonna make people raise their hands, but if you think about it, I'm sure there have been times that you have wanted to punch somebody in the nose or kill somebody or you know do harm to somebody else. You know, even if it was just a fleeting second. And now did you decide not to punch that person in the nose or not to kill them or not to poison them or not to set their house on fire because you were afraid of being arrested and being sent to prison? Or did you not do this because you said, hmm, that is not a good response to me being angry or irritated or annoyed in this moment. So if you think about it, policing in prisons did not stop that man from killing her. It will not deter other people who believe that trans people are disposable, that believe women are disposable, women of color are disposable, um, for people who target sex workers, it will not diminish their belief that sex workers have less protection from police and therefore they can get away with this more in the United States that we have had, had numerous instances in which we have had serial killers kill sex workers because they knew that police would not investigate their deaths anywhere near as thoroughly as 
they would if the person was not a sex worker because sex workers are viewed as disposable both here and there. So having a carceral response is not going to stop that. What does stop that is a longer is a longer challenge. It's like, how do we eradicate uh, transphobia? How do we eradicate uh, you know, the, the misogyny behind it being okay to harm and abuse and possibly kill women? How do we eradicate uh, the idea that some people are worth less than others? You know, in the case of this, uh, this, this US military person, you know, his idea that uh, he could kill a trans Filipino woman because he was a white guy, you know, in the US, you know, from the United States and some bodies in his mind were more disposable than others. And then how do we, at the same time promote safety for people. You know, like, what does that mean? Um, before the pandemic, I was in England and I was in a pub and I went to the bathroom and I noticed that in the women's room, uh, there was a big poster on the back of the door that said, are you feeling unsafe? Is your, um, you know, is your Tinder date not who they appear? Are you not feeling safe? If so, go to the bar and ask for Angela. And the bartender and the bar the, the bartender and the pub staff will help you get to safety. You don't have to make a big deal and be like, hey, you know, I don't feel so safe with my date, but you know, you could just go. And there was this way to go and ask for help without making a big deal about it. And then I had somebody go to the men's room to see if there was a similar sign there. There was not, um, obviously. So what are ways in which safety could be promoted? So that that way it might not have saved Jennifer's life. She might not have, you know, thought anything. Alarm bells might not have rung in her head when she originally went on the date before they went to a place, you know, to a more private place. But if there were, perhaps having, or maybe if an alarm bell had slightly gone off and then she brushed it off as, I'm overreacting, you know, this is a nice guy, you know. Um, but then she went to the bathroom and saw that sign. She might say, hmm, you know, maybe I will, you know, go home tonight and see if I want to go see this person again tomorrow. Maybe if there had been some other options, it might not have helped in that particular situation, but it might help other people in other situations if there were supports. So on the one hand, it's how do we eradicate these insidious beliefs that, th that make some people disposable and make them much more vulnerable to violence both by individuals and by state actors such as the police, um, like when you talked about the the young woman who was uh, who was killed uh, who was killed by the police, and then also how do we build up these kinds of supports so that that way people who are vulnerable to violence can feel not only feel safer but be safer and be supported in community. Thank you for that, Victoria. That was um, it was very insightful. Indeed, uh, we have to find ways to, um, to make people safer and get out of that harmful situation. Um, mm -hmm. There's a comment here that people uh, voted in the Padlet. Uh, While the start of justice is rather new or ignored by the government in the Philippines, there are some rural areas in the country where the focus of solving dispute lies in restoring the relations between members in the community. I think it's also because of the proximity of how oh, police- Oh, will you slow process. down? Because oh, because sorry. your words are all kind of running together and I'm like, wait, what are Gosh. you saying? <laughs> Gosh, so. sorry about that. Okay. Um, it's okay. Mm. While restorative justice is rather new or ignored by the government in the Philippines, there are some rural areas in the country where the focus of solving disputes lies on restoring relations between members of the community. I think it is also because of the proximity and how policing is not as rampant in rural communities as it is within urban areas. Indeed, uh, yeah. Uh, I've been told by some other people that indigenous communities in, in this country um, often have to rely on community, uh, on, on their own community to solve disputes rather than the police because there's no police in their area. or if the police are involved, 
they view incarceral violence as uh, not solutions, as not justice, because they, they feel that uh, imprisoning people did not um, did not solve their issue, did not solve the underlying issues of, of their conflict. So sometimes uh, I've been told that some indigenous communities don't go to the police at all because of this. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, um, I, I want to give one more definition that I realized mm -hmm. I, I didn't because I talked for so long, um, is that, you know, we talked about restorative justice, but then you bring up, uh, you know, the, the, the murder, you know, and the like lack of accountability, or I, I guess bring up two other things to think about um, of the person who killed her. So there's restorative justice, but then there's also something called transformative justice, um, which is, if you think about it, it's like a deeper type of restorative justice. It's like, so instead of just restoring things to where they were before, it's like looking at the conditions that enabled this harm and said, what needs to happen so that this never happens again? So it's a community process, again, that addresses not only the needs of the person who was harmed and, you know, uh, pushes the, survive, uh, the person who did the harm to take accountability and responsibility for their actions, but also says, what are the conditions that enabled this harm? So we just talked about, you know, what, you know, how do we root out the transphobia that, you know, makes people believe that trans women are disposable? How do we root out the racism that makes people believe brown people, are, that makes white people and perhaps other people think that, you know, brown people are disposable. How do we, you know, root out, you know, the misogyny that makes people think that it is okay to abuse and harm women, you know, in ways that they would not necessarily abuse and harm men. Um, so instead of looking at the acts of violence in a vacuum, um, like the legal system does, which says, you know, person A committed harm against person B, what have you to say about, you know, about this? transformative justice processes ask what else needs to change so that this never happens again? And then what needs to happen so that the survivor can heal? So it's both survivor centered, but it also looks at the wider, uh, the wider context of why, you know, these things, of how these things happen. Like perhaps, you know, in the case of say, uh, a community or a party where people know that somebody is, you know, constantly, sexually abusing or sexually assaulting uh, women. So I'm going to give the, you know, the famous in the US Hollywood example of uh, Harvey Weinstein, the movie producer who spent decades sexually assaulting and sexually abusing women in the Hollywood scene, whether it was like actresses or would be actresses or the, you know, the women who worked behind the scenes but wanted to like, you know, make their careers in Hollywood. And he had so much power in Hollywood that women were afraid to either say no to him or to report him. Um, when they did say no to him, he would tank their careers. He would call other producers and directors and say, that actress is a total nightmare to work with. I heard that you're thinking of casting her in your movie. Don't do it, take it from me. And women you know, stopped getting callbacks. They stopped getting work. So this man had a lot of power but it was also pretty well known that he was a sexual predator and people allowed him to continue preying on women because he produced these movies that I guess were big blockbusters. So, you know, like, so in that arena of transformative justice would not just say Harvey Weinstein and the dozens of women whose lives, you know, who's, who he sexually assaulted, but also like, what is this about this whole Hollywood movie scene that enabled this harm? You know, what about all the people who noticed that something was a little bit off or noticed that, uh, you know, like he was sexually predatory and never said anything? What about all the, like, you know, like people who heard these whispers and did not, uh, and did not say anything? What about people who knew the survivors and did not support them and encourage them to keep quiet, to, you know, uh, keep their careers? You know, what about the people who, you know, colluded with him to cover these you know, acts up. So what would need to change in that scenario for, you know, for this never to happen again and for there never to be another person in that type of power where they could then say, you know, ruin, you know, potentially ruin the careers of dozens of women if they did not acquiesce uh, to their sexual assault. And with transformative justice, there's no 
blueprints. There's no wrong set or right set of footprints to follow in transformative justice. And instead, each process depends on the people and the circumstances. Uh, one strategy for transformative justice is something called community accountability, which is a community-based strategy, again, rather than relying on policing and prisons, to address violence within the community. But again, rather than saying like, okay, you know, let's just restore the relationship. So you say, sorry, you accept the apology, we're done. You know, it's a process in which a community it could be a group of friends, it could be a family, it could be a neighborhood, a church, a workplace, work together to address somebody's abusive behavior and they create a process for them to account for their actions and transform their behavior. And at the same time, also work with the survivor to address their needs. So, so it, you know, uh, at the same time, we need to think that, uh, we need to remember that you can't force somebody to be accountable. So the US soldier who killed, uh, who killed somebody, you know, there's nothing there that has made him be accountable for his actions. He served some prison time, he got a pardon, he gets to go back to the US. I am sure that in his special prison, nothing was done to say, why did you think it was okay to kill A, anyone? B, you know, uh, this woman that you just, B, this woman that you just met, C, this trans woman, you know, like, like let's get to the like causes of why you thought that this was okay to do. You know, and I'm sure that he did not get any of that. Um, so, and at the same time, putting him in a circle, say with all of her family, whether it be chosen family or biological family and her loved ones, if he's just going to stand, sit there and be like, I don't need to be accountable is not helpful. But for people who want to stay in community, who want to stay in these relationships, such as the family who had abused their children in hollow water, you know, like, it could be a way to start moving forward, but also to eradicate or start uprooting um, the conditions that have caused this, you know, again and again and again, you know? So, you know, what are the conditions that cause, you know, this endemic sexual abuse that happens at Hollow Water for, you know, for uh, people who are, you know, trans, what are the conditions that, you know, happen that need to be eradicated so that they can be safer from violence. I mean, one thing is like, you know, uprooting, you know, these, you know, transphobia and violence against women, but what are things that can be done? So it's not just, you know, like you punch somebody and you say, sorry, and it's done, but also why, what are the root causes of this? Like, did you do this because you don't like, you know, people of color? Did you do this because you're racist? So, uh, so that is one of the many strategies that transformative justice can take. Thanks for that. Actually, that was actually an upcoming question. <laughs> so thank you for preempting that. The question was, how do you distinguish between restorative justice and transformative justice? Thanks for preempting. <laughs> um, let's, let's look. Um, here's another interesting question about uh, pandemic policing, COVID and domestic violence. Domestic violence uh, has become more rampant now because of quarantine isolation. Were there new ways of programs in the United States to address this? Because the context uh, is that the Philippines has the world's longest lockdown, uh, and it's pretty bad for uh, domestic violence. There, are, there has been some news reports about it. I'm not sure about the US, but that's what happened in the Philippines. So the, in the, yeah. go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was going to say in the US, there have been a drastic up increase in calls to domestic violence hotlines and people seeking help because they're trapped at home with abusive partners. And in addition, one of the things we know about abuse and violence is that, and this is not a, to excuse people who abuse, but we know that stress exacerbates uh, people's you know, uh, tendencies to abuse and be violent. So again, not to excuse people because many people are stressed about the pandemic and do not go around abusing their loved ones. But we do know that, you know, stress, whether it's economic stress, you know, like uh, being stuck in your house stress, be, you know, worrying that like you might die from a fatal disease if you go to the grocery store stress, you know, just exacerbates the tension and the stress and the violence. Um, so in the US, there has been an uptick in calls as well to domestic violence hotlines. But also one of the problems 
in the U.S., and I'm sure this is also a problem in the Philippines and anywhere where domestic violence is a huge problem, is that there's a lack of resources for people experiencing domestic violence. I mean, now that we are in a pandemic, it is not so safe to bundle yourself up and go to a shelter with like that houses 25 people that you've never met before and uh, may or may not have COVID, you know? And even before the pandemic, these places often were uh, filled. They like didn't necessarily have the capacity. So what are some strategies that need to happen is instead of saying like, we need more policing to deal with domestic violence, because what does that do? It perhaps takes the person I don't know about in the Philippines, but in the United States, it might take a person out of the house for a day or two. And then they go before a judge and then they're released and then they just go home and they're even more angry because their partner called the police on them and you know, all hell breaks loose. But what would happen if there was you know, more housing, safe, affordable and accessible housing for people to be able to go, you know, whether it's like you know, repurposed hotel rooms or you know, a room in somebody's apartment where they're like, okay, you can come, you can quarantine here, you know, you can stay. But you know, what if there were more safe options for people to be able to leave in the US? I don't know about in the Philippines. One of the resources that domestic violence victims and survivors have said that they have lacked the most when thinking about whether or not to flee is where am I going to go? You know, what kind of housing am I going to get? Um, I interviewed one woman who actually, and also is this resource going to be available to meet my needs? I met, I interviewed before the pan, years before the pandemic, one domestic violence survivor who had four children and she had, she had six children, two of them were grown, four of them were younger. Uh, and she remarried somebody who turned out to be abusive. So she called the domestic violence hotline um, and said, you know, like, I am in this abusive relationship, please help me, I have four children, we need a place to go. So the domestic violence organization found her a spot in a shelter with a catch, and the shelter could take her and two of her four children, but they could not take all four. I don't know why, but they could not. And so she was not going to play which children do I love the most and which children am I going to leave, you know, with my with their abusive stepfather when he comes home and realizes that we've left. She said, okay, I'm just going to stay put because if I'm here, I can protect all my children to the best of my ability. If I leave with two of my kids, two of them are still here and they are not protected at all. And so there needs to be there need to be options that can accommodate people needs and not say like, well, we only have three beds. It might say, yeah, we only have three beds. Uh, can some of your children sleep on the floor? Can, you know, they double up in beds? Maybe we like grab a couch from the living room, something, you know, and not necessarily these rigid things. But in the US, we have a lot of money that goes to policing and prisons. Like, if we were to do a chart, you know, like they would be up here and the amount of money that goes to things like housing and shelter and other supports that actually enable people to get out of these abusive relationships. Um, whether temporarily while they renegotiate like what the terms are and figure things out or permanently or just down here. So um, I, you know, at the same time, it's like, so when we talk about pandemic policing, we should also be talking about the lack of resources that have always been not available to people who need to get out of abusive situations and violent situations. Thank you for that. That sounds really messed up that they that they give the option to leave two children behind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, um, let's, let's see, let's look at some people in the comments. Mm -hmm. um, person who named themselves nobody says um, uh, in some com there are some com that there in some communities there are community feuds that turn into bloody clan wars in some areas in the Philippines. Uh, I'm not sure of the scope and usual root issues because news agencies don't usually elaborate it, but these usually engage outside the established justice system. Um, well. Actually, from my time in government, I know that 
the government does have some local peace process for reserved for family feuds, though I'm not uh, aware of the extent of this program, but it's a thing. <laughs> Uh, Ali says, community accountability is so interesting to think about here. I don't know if anyone else has had similar observations, but whenever high-profile celebrities or influencers are outed for any kind of abuse, their friends and family are quick to either cover up or defend their loved ones. And I don't know if there's ever been any large-scale or meaningful reckoning with involvement of the abuser's own community relationships and the enabling of the abuse. Indeed. Um, and then Hani says, I think it's important to look into the dynamics of these harms and abuses happening. I don't think we have that kind of, uh, that's, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, so I'm going to mention about that. Um, oh. So what v he was talking about earlier, that in the context of the United States, we do have like domestic violence hotline. Um, so per state or per city, you can find resources, though it's still not enough to support, um, you know, victims or survivors of domestic violence. There are, I'll just say as, um, say this comparing it to the context in the Philippines, there are at least, you know, resources available um, to people harmed by domestic violence or um, survivors. And like in the Philippines, we don't have that. Um, I, from my understanding, um, you know, like what I've said, experiencing domestic violence is that you, once you go to the police, they will refer you to um, DSWD, which is um, Department of Social Welfare. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I forgot what is it, but um, yeah. So, and we know how or how DSWD is like in the Philippines. So. We don't have shelters. We don't have transitional housings whatsoever in the Philippines. So, it's it's just basically what's happening is that they keep on referring you to other organizations or institutions, but there is really no support at all. Uh, thank you for that, Tony. Um, I see Joey. Uh has raised the hand. Are you okay with being recorded, Joey? Sure, I'm perfect. Okay. I'm good with that. Sure. So okay. yes, uh, oh, go ahead. yes, I'm supporting a campaign to start decriminalizing uh, abortions in the Philippines, and I'm just mm. curious um, how easy it is in your communities for survivors to uh, to access safe abortion services, and how have uh, uh, the carceral approach. Uh, impeded these access to uh, abortion and other uh, other necessary uh, sexual and reproductive health services for survivors. So I'm just curious. Yeah, thank you. That is an excellent. Yes, thank you. And I would love to hear more about the campaign to support the decriminalization of abortion there at some point. Um, so in the United States, um, every state. So we have 50 states and every state has its own laws around abortion. Um, so, so far abortion is legal in all 50 states, but different states put different restrictions um, on abortion. So in some states, uh, there are fewer restrictions than others. So say in, um, gosh, sorry, it is like 1030 at night here. So if my brain is a little wonky, uh, please excuse me. Um, but in some states like Mississippi and Louisiana, there are lots of restrictions around abortions so that it makes it fairly difficult, if not impossible for anyone to access abortion. Some states have uh, laws that say you cannot have an abortion past a certain amount of time. I believe it was some state in the South, Tennessee, Mississippi, or Louisiana, and I'm not sure which one, I can't remember which one, uh, recently passed or tried to pass a law that said you could not have an abortion after six weeks after uh, conception. When most people do not know whether or not they are pregnant for you know at least six weeks. So it basically outlaws abortion unless you immediately go run and try to get a, a uh, pregnancy test immediately after you have either had sex or been sexually assaulted. Um, so in the United States, the varying degrees of how easy or hard it is 
to get an abortion varies on which state you're in and what kind of politicians have been attacking abortion rights in that state. Um, in Kentucky, there is only one abortion state in the entire clinic. Um, Kentucky is this weird long type of a state, which means that if you're in like this part of Kentucky and the abortion clinic is here, it might be like a day long drive to get there. And then you might have to stay overnight. So you can you know, go to the clinic the next morning, which then puts this financially out of reach, even for people who are not survivors of sexual violence, people who just have an unplanned and unwanted pregnancy. Um, and I say all this to say that there's a host of obstacles to being able to obtain a safe, you know, um, a safe and legal abortion in the United States, even though abortion is technically still legal. Um, in some states, like have, some states have waiting periods for uh, abortion. So if you want to uh, access an abortion, you go and then they tell you, you know, like they do your intake and they do everything else. And then they say, you have to come back in 24 or 48 hours. And those laws are there because they're hoping that pregnant people will change their minds and not um, go through with an abortion. And then in most states, abortions are very expensive as well, which then means that sometimes that makes it harder for low income people to be able to access abortions. Because if an abortion is several hundred dollars, it means that somebody who is living from paycheck to paycheck or hand to mouth or barely surviving economically, it means that they are not going to necessarily just have $400 at their disposal to be able to go pay for an abortion. Um, and in the United States, uh, you could, in some states you can get uh, an abortion in the second trimester, but it is more expensive. It is more costly. Uh, it takes more time. It's a two day procedure usually. Um, and the cost then skyrockets from say $400 to $1,000. Those numbers are over 10 years old. Um, I'm sure that those numbers have changed, but perhaps the proportion of, you know, uh, this cost to that cost has not, but it jumps dramatically, which means then again, it penalizes people for being poor, for being low income. Um, and I believe that many uh, low income insurances, it's been a while since I've actually covered um, abortion access in terms of insurance and medical coverage, um, you know, do, do not pay for abortions or only pay for certain types of abortion procedures and not others, which then again makes it uh, less accessible. So in terms of decriminalizing, you know, in terms of abortion access for survivors of sexual assault, um, all of these barriers are there. And then if you have been sexually assaulted, you're still also dealing with trauma and, you know, abuse. And um, I'm not actually sure if there's like, you know, any, you know, support for, you know, in terms of uh, like the legal system for people who are seeking abortions as a result of sexual assault. And after laying all of this out and thinking about it, um, if you are in a state that is very hostile to abortion, Alabama, Tennessee, Mississippi, these are all states in the South, in the United States South, by the way, um, that are very fairly uh, conservative, they are very uh, anti-abortion. Lawmakers are constantly trying to chip away at uh, the ways that abortions can be done and putting more restrictions and regulations on, you know, how abortion clinics can be run. Um, the legal system is not going to be very sympathetic to a survivor who is seeking an abortion because they believe that abortion is wrong and bad and that is it. Um, and not any sort of, you know, how do we support the survivor when the survivor has a pregnancy as a result of uh, being assaulted. I'm sorry, I don't actually know if I answered your question, Joey. <laughs> Thank you for uh, answering that. Uh, Victoria, how many more questions are you willing to take? Because I know it's getting late there. <laughs> I think I could probably take two more. Um, two more, okay. The third one might be kind of loopy. Uh, you I know, see. But as, as you might notice, I'm like rambling a little bit more now. So I'm like, oh, <laughs> I should, you know. So are there questions from the Padlet that are or oh, there's one. This oh, I'm sorry. Or do you think it will work as well? If, for example, there are some questions that you were not able to answer, we can send it to you through email, 
and you can just answer to your email and then we'll send it to these people who ask these questions or we can send it to you know the group itself that we have yeah i mean like i i would say like let's see if i can get through two okay more questions because it is kind of like you know like but then after that i'm like oh my you know uh my 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 coherence may just lag and people might just be like we don't know what she just told us thank you for staying okay thank you for that um there's this interesting question the connection between abolitionism and private lives uh what should we say to people who don't believe abolitionism extends even to the domestic sphere in my experience we are taught to separate the public of politics police from the privacy of our sexual relationships or relationships with our family. How can we account or explain how these interconnect in or through the process of abolition? That's interesting. Hmm. So. I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly. So I'm going to phrase it. And then if whoever asked that question did not mean it that way, like raise your hand or put something in the chat or something else. So I don't spend a lot of time answering a question you did oh. not ask. Um, we can so, oh. Uh, we can alternatively ask the person who asked this question to elaborate uh, if they're still in the okay. chat. This. Sure. Okay. Uh, are you still here? <laughs> because uh, there are no usernames in the Padlet. So, um, if the person who asked this question is here, maybe they'd like to elaborate. Ah, that was you. Okay. So, you want to elaborate? <laughs> okay. So you have the floor. Ah, <laughs> uh, would you prefer to type? Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but just to give some context, I think it's also because of like in the Philippines, we are very conservative when talking about family issues. Like we often like, you know, hide it under the rug. Like we find it still taboo to talk about, you know, um, personal relationship issues or like family issues outside the house. Um, we think that doing that or like people who will engage in those conversations, we often call them chismosa or I think this, you know, chisme or chismosa, like someone who's like interfering with other people's business. Um, again, the Philippines, they don't like that very much thank you for for clarifying that both Ali and honey uh so i mean i think the thing is we when we think about abolition and i think it's helpful to think of abolition as you know a set of relationships so it's not just we don't call police so um so you know people who are taught to be like this is a family matter or this is a private matter often are already not calling the police um, so it's not that helpful to be like, abolition is don't call the police. And people say, well, we already don't call the police, but we still want this person to stop this terrible behavior. Um, but instead say, you know, like what are ways to, you know, like that you address harm and conflict. And some of this again is the like, you know, like how do we uproot these ideas that it is okay to do certain things to certain people. Um, so I think part of it is, you know, like when you talk about uh family lives and things like that it might be helpful to ask questions and be like what you know like why what why when where how like you know like what is needed to like you know why is this harm happening like why is this person causing this harm you know like and then how do we how do we transform those conditions to be able to you know stop that and it might also be like what does the survivor want you know like does the survivor you know want to get out or do they want the harm to stop? And I think there's also this pushback against like, uh, and I don't know enough about Philippine culture. So I don't want to overstep and say like, oh yeah, you know, like just do this. But you know, like how do you then, you know, like what are the ways in which, you know, like community can come into play in other ways? So, you know, like if people have communities that they're already plugged into uh, instead of, folks that are just sort of like outsiders, but you know, are there trusted, you know, siblings or trusted best, you know, best friends or people in their, you know, circles, if people are religious and they go to church, are there trusted members in the church that might be able to like, 
gently intervene, you know, and be like, hey, you know, we noticed that you, you know, you're often shouting at your wife, you know, what's going on? Are you upset? Are you angry? You know, and I don't know if that would work because again, I don't have the cultural context and I don't want to overstep, but it might be helpful to think of like, what are ways in which, uh, what are the connections that people have in the relationships that are there already and how to kind of like mobilize those people to think that, you know, we don't get involved in this, like this is not our business. That is just between that family over there even if everybody hears, you know, or knows that this, there's harm going on, you know, but how do we actually, like, you know, like, you know, be like, hey, you know, what are ways in which, instead of saying like, what are ways in which we like intervene and get in their business? Like, how do we support, you know, this family in like being safer or being healthier or being more whole? For that. Kylie <laughs> um, Ad wants to add, I think, in addition to what Hani is saying, I think it's also a question about the ways we think about change within our interpersonal lives. Like when we return to the question of community accountability, we are asked to move beyond this paradigm of thinking about justice. Justice begins to move from the so-called public sphere of courts and judges where it is a someone to prosecute and defend into a more intimate circle of relationships. Hmm. Thank you for that. Hani. So <laughs> let's look at, uh, are you ready for the final question? <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Uh, so the last question here is, is there a correlation between the state's view and or response on mental health and anti-incarceration? Um, this question is a bit vague to me. So if a person is here and would like to elaborate, uh, feel free to speak up. But it was the most voted last question. So that's why I okay. <laughs> called it out. Um, but if you feel like it's too big, I can move to the, other, to the next one. <laughs> Unless the person is here and would like to elaborate. Um, anyone here? You're not raising your hand. <laughs> so um, I think I'll leave it up to you if you want, if you think you have you have the capacity to answer the question or if you'd like to oh. uh, move on oh, no. to the next one. Uh, what do you think? Well, I mean, briefly, you know, in the United States, there's been this, um, this idea as the police have gotten more funding um, and they, they keep police departments and police unions keep looking for ways to expand themselves and revamp themselves as friendly or nicer police or, you know, targeting different uh, populations. So there's been this increase in mental health, this idea that when you have a mental health crisis or mental health problems, you call 911 and the police show up. And in the United States, there's this long, tragic pattern of police showing up uh, as part of these mental health calls or these wellness checks and then brutalizing or killing the person that has a mental health concern because uh, or is in crisis because they are actually not trained in dealing with mental health issues nor do many of them want to be trained so it's not a question of training but it's that you know you're calling somebody whose, I, whose purpose is to subdue and arrest somebody and that is actually not what somebody who is in a mental health crisis or a problem, um, you know, uh, needs or wants in that moment. So uh, in some states, in some cities, not some states, in some cities, there's been, there's starting to be a move away from uh, calling 911 when somebody is in a mental health crisis to other programs. So in Eugene, Oregon, so Oregon is in the Northwest. Um, it's, you know, known for either having hippies or having white supremacists, depending on which part of the state you are in. Um, in Eugene, Oregon, which is primarily a college town, it is a hippie town. Um, it is also a town that has had a 27, maybe 28 year program called Cahoots. I will send this to Honey and um, tomorrow, like more information about it, because I don't remember what it stands for, it's something like crisis assistance something, 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 where basically if you call um, a number, and I forget if it's routed through 911 or through something else now at this moment, um, instead of having the police show up with their guns and, you know, their SWAT teams, but you call and you say like, my son is having a mental health crisis or my daughter is having a mental health crisis, you know, like I need help. I don't know what to do. I'm afraid for them. Um, 
mental health counselors come, people who are trained in how to de-escalate, how to like calm a situation down and they show up instead and they say like, you know, what do you need? And they assess the situation and they try to, you know, get the person to some means of stability, whether it's going to a hospital or being like, hey, what do you need in this moment to like calm down? But it is not people with guns and tasers and, you know, all sorts of other harmful devices who only know how to subdue people by force. Um, so in that sense, like in the U.S., there's with the advent or the emergence of the defund the police movement that has happened over the summer in the United States following the police murdering George Floyd in Minneapolis, um, other cities are more seriously considering how do we address mental health crises and mental health problems instead of just having somebody call 911 because they're you know, at their wit's end and they don't know what to do for their loved one who is in crisis and then have that person be brutalized or killed by the police, but are saying like, what are the programs? What are other alternatives to getting people help in a way that doesn't result in violence or death to that person, if that makes sense. Um, and at the same time, we also just need to remember that like people who are having who are not in crisis and are having mental health issues may not necessarily always want to like say be locked away in a hospital or forcibly put on medication. So again, kind of like uh, models that center the survivor, it's like, what does this person need to survive and thrive? Not necessarily how do we sh shoehorn them into, you know, like our definition of what uh, people who are mentally and emotionally healthy might look like, you know, and yes, you need to like take this medication or you need to go to that hospital or you need to be locked away in this place. But like, what do we do to help people so that they don't end up in crisis again and again? And what do we do to make sure that they are able to like, I guess, live as best a life as possible under capitalism? Thank you for that. That was actually a good uh, insightful answer. Thank you. It does make sense. Um, I, that, I do hope in the Philippines similar programs can uh, show up. We do have a system of um, what we call TANODs, but some who, who do wellness checks instead of police, or, or mm -hmm. rather are equivalent to wellness checks. But sometimes TANODs reproduce policing, sometimes they don't. It really depends on context sometimes. So, I mean, <laughs> In the United States, yeah. too, there's the understanding that, like, you know, these programs can't survive on their own. Like, there's the, like, in the United States recently, over the past six, seven months, there's been a demand to shift funding and resources away from the police to these kinds of programs. So instead of saying, like, we're giving the police, you know, one billion US dollars to establish a mental health SWAT team and give them all training, it's to say, like, what could you do with one billion US dollars in terms of mental health services for people in the communities. Maybe it's, we need more men, smaller community clinics where people can go before they hit crisis, you know, but that takes money, that takes resources. So, you know, why are we giving this money to police to have, you know, mental health teams that just shoot and kill people? Why are we giving it to police to have these, you know, ridiculous, at least in the United States, these ridiculous military grade weapons that they don't need and just use to terrorize people. And instead, like, how do we shift this towards uh, the people and the communities that like, you know, could benefit from, you know, having more resources instead of just giving them more police and the threat of more prisons instead. Indeed, yeah, I, I agree. Um, there's a similar phenomenon here in the Philippines where, um, the beginning of the lockdown and the start of the pandemic, uh, the police, the government funded uh, police programs and deployed police resources and military resources more than they did deploy uh, medical resources. And up to today, the government refuses to implement um, uh, pro medical programs that have proven to work, like mass testing. Mm -hmm. And up to today, they continue the regime of pandemic policing, which has continued to victimize people, uh, like the police have killed uh, dozens of people just in the pandemic policing alone. It's it's frustrating. <laughs> mm. Longest lockdown in the world and deadliest too, in terms of pandemic policing. Um, so 
I actually, uh, <laughs> so thank you for joining us, Victoria. <laughs> Would you have any uh, closing notes you'd like to say? Or if not, uh, we can just move on. <laughs> um, I, I am very glad to be spending, you know, that you all woke up early-ish to like speak with me, you know, like, and that I'm really excited that there are folks thinking about abolition, but also abolition in terms of domestic and sexual violence, because in the United States, uh, you know, abolition and, you know, abolition kind of came up here and uh, responses to gender-based violence, sexual violence and domestic violence um, came up here. And oftentimes they were kind of at cross purposes. Um, I will, in the morning, and if you don't hear from me by Sunday, whenever Sunday is for you, ping me. I wanna send some uh, books and websites and resources that also might be helpful in terms of thinking about, you know, what is, you know, like what other people have been doing and, you know, like what mm -hmm. some resources are. So um, in 2003, uh, the organization Incite Women of Color Against Violence, which is a uh, loose collective of women of color working to end domestic and sexual violence, uh, co-authored a statement with Critical Resistance, which is a, a prison abolitionist group started by Angela Davis and many other uh, people who have been doing prison abolition work for decades, authored a statement on the ways in which these two movements kind of left each other behind. So people who are looking at stopping domestic violence and sexual violence were calling for more policing and more prisons because they didn't see other ways to address these types of violence. And then people who are calling for prison abolition were not talking about ways to address gender-based and family violence. Uh, they were just acting as if, you know, like you could just not call police and these things, you know, would magically go away. So it is super encouraging and exciting to see that, you know, one of the first things that you're addressing is how do we look at this, you know, from an, how do we look at stopping or intervening um, and uprooting all of the things that cause domestic, sexual, you know, and family violence from an abolitionist perspective, rather than having these two things come up and then have to like somehow like make them start to come together in this, you know, uh, very tense and fragmented way. So that is super encouraging. I am very excited, even if you can't tell right now, um, that you invited me to talk. Um, there are some resources that I'll share um, tomorrow or the day after, uh, you know, of different websites, different organizations, different resources that you can find online um, of ways to intervene in uh, violence. There's a great 500 something page uh, resource online called Creative Interventions, uh, which actually is a sort of toolkit for, you know, uh, community accountability and how to intervene in domestic and sexual violence. And it includes people's stories of how they did so and what happened, both successful and not so successful. Um, there are other resources around transformative justice and restorative justice that I'd like to also send so that that way you don't feel like you're just trying to figure things out, you know, from ground zero, but also like being like, okay, you know, we really like this idea. And now let's try to figure out how this would work in the Philippine context of people being very private about their lives. You know, what are things that are helpful for us and what are things that are really not gonna fly in this moment? And I think it's always helpful to have those kinds of resources. Thank you for that, Victoria. I will forward the resources that you'll give us to all the participants who've registered. So <laughs> thanks for that. Um, if you're watching this from the recording, thanks for joining us. Um, okay. Keep an eye out for future events.